Um, but moderating this event tonight, we have Diane Smith, who's the, edit the deputy editor of the BJP, the British Journal of Photography. Can I ask you to please switch off your mobile phones? And uh, when it comes to the question and answer session, can you speak directly into the microphone for our online audience? Thanks very much. Okay, so, um, well, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. Um, Liz is going to show her work first, um, followed by Gideon. Um, Liz Hingley um, is probably best known for a project called um, Under Gods, um, which helped to win her an award in the Ian Parry. Um, she's been working on a project with Save the Children. Um, it's uh, Liz along with six other photographers, and they're um, taking photographs looking at poverty and how it affects people in the UK. Um, Liz has been working particularly with a family um, called the Jones family who live in Wolverhampton. And I'll let her take it over. Well, I thought. Um is that let the lights go? Um, I'm going to start by showing um, some work from my previous project, Under God's Stories from Soho Road, which has been my sort of most major project in my career so far, and really led on to this work with Save the Children, um, and my my approach um, can somehow explain. So, I I got um, after I graduated from Brighton, I got. Um, a residency, a scholarship in a place called Fabrica in Italy. And when I was there and I was really trying to find myself as a photographer and thinking what I wanted to do, I was and going back to Birmingham and between Italy, I really realised, um, well, I was interested in sort of the, the different ways that religions were being um, expressed and explored um, in these places. And I decided I, I was wanted to look at the growth of uh, multi-faith urban communities and I went back to Birmingham and well I was really aware of the situation now after my upbringing being the only white child in my nursery class and I, you know in my school we sort of celebrated everybody's religion and so I wanted to, so I found um, the Soho Road uh, this is the Soho Road which looks rather boring when you first enter it but over 18 months I discovered it wasn't so boring and I lived with and documented, um, well, on the street there are over 30 different religious buildings that act as centres for many different religious denominations and serve ethnic groups from all over the world. And it was really important for me to show really um, the everyday uh, life and of religion and how it was being practiced in the everyday because that's what I'd experienced in my upbringing and I didn't want to show um, the religious buildings or what the te people were preaching. I really wanted to know what people believed their religion was and how they were practicing it rather than reading the text and trying to translate that because I feel that religion is really lived out in, in people and in very different ways depending on the situation and the place and time. But this wasn't such an easy um, place to access on Soho and everyone's always so interested to know how I got into all these communities and it took a lot of time and, um, and sort of building a trusting relationship over a sustained amount of time. And it would have seemed easier just to work with one <coughs> community at a time, but actually because of different people's celebrations and things that are happening over different periods. I needed to constantly keep in contact with all of them and I would wake up um, the Hare Krishnas at 5 a.m. chanting and then you know later on the I would go to the Cannon Street Baptist and it'd be a baptism in the church um, and then in the afternoon I'd be with the Jesus Army in the tent for a wedding and it was yeah you sort of went home at the end of the day and you've been to so many different worlds just within one street it's in this tiny context and it was a really difficult project to realize um, when it was finished because I was constantly finding new communities um, all the time and every community had a different religion or if it wasn't a different religion it was a different way of practicing it. So even with the Buddhists there were Thai Buddhists, Sri Lankan Buddhists, Indian Buddhists and Vietnamese Buddhists and they all took a completely different well, way that I had to engage with them and understand what it meant for them what they were practicing. Sorry. 
I'll just let these go. And it was, really was a sort of a fundamental time for me to develop my approach with photography and and connecting engagement with people and yeah it was really had to be a collaborative process in this place I was giving people back images all the time and it became really important working on digital to be able to give people pictures of their, their weddings also their funerals um, and I also gave um, sort of other forms of exchange. I drove the Thai Buddhist monks um, to the market um, in 5 a.m. because their spiritual status means they can't drive. And I babysat for a Muslim family. So there were different sort of ways that we negotiated this relationship over a long period of time. And I really didn't know how this work was going to be taken. I mean, everybody said to me when I began it that, oh, religion, it's very difficult. People don't know what to do with it. Um, but I've been really amazed at, um, yeah, the response and how it's sort of opened up a lot of debate and dialogue. And these, I kind of keep saying this project's got its own legs now because it's sort of things are happening around it that I, I'm amazed at. Um, and I was very... Um, amazing, yeah, please. That um, the book was um, published by Darish Lewis recently, um, and I've won a few awards. And one of the awards was um, the Impari. And as part of the prize, I um, I got this commission to be part of this project documenting child poverty in the UK, uh, which I didn't really know what it meant when I started, and I just started doing a master's in social anthropology at University College London, and I thought I didn't really have the time to do a big thing, but it was an honour to be part of it. And then, as I began, I realised and got the statistics and um, discussed with Save the Children about what this project was, I became um, yeah really it became something that I felt was very important to do and an honour to be part of this group trying to sort of tell the story of these different families and what what poverty really, trying to see what poverty is. Again, like I was looking at religion in the everyday now being lived, what is poverty and um, is it these sort of stereotypes that we see it? And I, um, um, educational work is quite a big part of um, what I do and through that I met two families um, that I decided I was interested in, I'd like to begin working with and I decided I wanted to work in the West Midlands again because I felt that was so heroic was in the West Midlands. I'd got a connection to communities there and also a lot of um, in Along the Soho Road, there were a lot of people who had who were very uh, financially deprived as well. So I'd sort of, um, yeah. Although that wasn't something I was focusing on, it came into my previous project too. Um, and I decided I particularly was interested in large families and the attendant issues of overcrowding, sort of developing from my real interest in community living. And I began working with this family, um, Najib's family. Um, and they're from Somalia and have both been in England, I think, seven years. Um, let me just get, to get it right. They're, they live in a one-bedroom flat and there are six of them with four children under five. And their mum sleeps in the bedroom with all the children and the dad sleeps in the sofa. And I met them through this, these two beautiful girls um, at the nursery that I was doing an artist in residency with. And they could no longer afford... Um, they go, for, I think it's five hour weeks that's allocated to them for free um, by the government. And before the, the next two children were born, um, the, mom, the parents used to pay for them just to have a few more hours in the nursery a week. And the mum said this was amazing to get a bit more free time away from them. But now the, um, the two new little ones have come, they couldn't afford that anymore. And really the only time the parents get together um, by themselves without the children is when they have their nap in the afternoon and even then they still have to stay in the house. Um, but I'm only, I'm going to briefly mention this family because um, I decided to stop. I thought it was an interesting point to make in this discussion that I decided that I, I didn't feel that um, I could continue working with this family and that it was, I could visually make work that could tell the story that needed to be told about um, yeah, about overcrowded housing and child poverty. I just visually, it wasn't quite working. 
and also I felt that the relationship with them well, you can see they're very beautifully well turned out children. And I think often it's interesting the issues what is poverty and how is it? What, how is it affecting them? It was visually just not very easy to, it was very limiting to, to be able to show. And also I felt, you know, the relationships with my uh, subjects are really important to me. And I found both these families myself, and they know me primarily as Liz. And, um, and I, you know, I really sort of tell them all about me and my background, and we really share quite a lot. And I felt this, um, the time that they would be able to give me with all the issues that they had going on as a family, a young family, we wouldn't really be able to have the right kind of, um, yeah. Um, well, I felt like I would be taking too much of them, perhaps. Um, so anyway, that was I just thought I dropped that in because I thought it was an interesting point, perhaps that it doesn't always work, and it's um, and then I was in, and also I began working with this other family, the Jones family, and it was really working, and so I that's kind of how I yeah I realised that I would focus on this family, and the Jones family is a very different situation, a white British. Um, family and the children aren't young, they're between 14 and 24, who really, I think the story is, are really stuck in this cycle of poverty. There are two parents and seven children in a three-bed, semi-detached council house in Wolverhampton. And this is actually the first house that the family has, ever, um, has lived in for three generations. The mother and father were brought up in caravans, as were their parents. And actually, interestingly, despite the, the limited size of the house, they've refused to move into large council accommodation as they feel that their house holds so many memories. So it's not, so there's a sort of interesting story there that I felt I really wanted to explore. And also the, the, the love within the family was so strong. I mean, there was initial sort of shock at the surroundings when I first went in with them, but there was, it's sort of soon after that, you just feel the warmth of the family, you kind of forget it. Um, quite, uh, yeah, not after long I was working with them. And it also they have such high aspirations for their futures and what they want to do. And the oldest is actually studying at uh, university, but the sad thing is they you know, he's 24 and has no idea how he, or when he could leave home because it'd be financially almost impossible for him. And I was photographing them, I'd been photographing with them, yeah, over all their sort of, I was a lot with them over Christmas and their birthdays, and I've really sort of befriended them, and I'm kind of, I, you know, I really look forward to going there at the weekends now instead of staying in London going out with friends and um, sharing their, the dime goes so quickly, I'll just spend a, you know, a day with them, and it goes, you know, all within the house. I decided it was really important just to focus, um, I think that's the only one out the window, um, within this confined space because that really is their life and I was there over the holidays and one girl actually hadn't left for two weeks the house um, during the holiday and they it was very cold and there isn't money to do other activities and it was you know sometimes I would go and it was so cold I would have to wear so many clothes because they don't put the heating on they only put it on once when the pipes froze and the council told them they had to put the heating on. Um, but they, they have a small gas fire um, downstairs that they put money on a card um, to keep it going. So I'll go through a few of these. Um, and I actually, I decided with this project that I wanted to um, to work on film again and working on a, on a camera, a Mamiya camera which isn't in my face and is down here so that I could really, it wouldn't um, make such boundaries between me and them and I could also work, get in really closely. And, um, and also I felt the film, I wanted the sort of feeling of film to create the atmosphere in this place. Um, and I'm really um, grateful to Fuji for sponsoring me. 
but this is still I want to stress really an ongoing project and it was quite nervous to show it tonight because I haven't shown it before and I'm kind of aware that the edit is going to completely change and um, I'm going to continue with them and I feel I really want to because as I've been going I've been seeing my work change and my relationship with them change and as the seasons change as well just the light within just working within the house it changes because they're wearing different clothes and although it's all the same background the light changes um, so it's really amazing um, I didn't really expect that this project would um, become such a big thing for me and I think um, it, I think it was also you know, very welcome after the other project where I was in so many different places all the time to work within the confines of this uh, five rooms has been yeah amazing Yeah, I thought there's another story that I thought I'd say is um, one of the girls who I, is sort of my main um, I say gatekeeper, I guess, to uh, when I can go and when I can't go. Um, she can't actually have, um, afford to get the, she's got sort of rotten teeth and she can't afford to go to the dentist to get them out. Um, that was one story that she told me. That was quite powerful. And then... Yeah, it's been amazing to, it's really opened my eyes because I don't, um, the sort of the issues are always in the background, they're constantly there um, discussing money and, but you can easily get carried away within the life of this house and they're young people and there's a lot of enjoyment and I, when they're there, you know, they've taught me many things like playing the Wii game, which I had no idea how to play before. Um, but then, you know, there'll be a discussion or in the middle of the football game, the TV um, will go off because you have to put a pound in it to keep make it keep going. And there'll be all uproar in the house, you know, just as they're about to do the goal and the TV goes. And, you know, and they sort of start fighting each other because nobody has a pound to put in it to make it going. So, um, yeah, I thought I would read you just a few quotes because I think that's going to be really important when I do. I've done some recordings, but um, I haven't sort of sorted them out yet. As I said, it's very much ongoing. But I think quotes is going to be an important part of the project, and I thought I'd read three. So, um, if I had the money, I would make our house nice and sparkly. I would, I'll would. i move out in the end, but I don't know where and I don't know how. We love this house, we love being together, this is our memories. Yeah. So I think that's where I'm at with it now. <laughs> okay, so um, I think now we'll um, hand over to Gideon Mendel. Um, he's won many World Press Photo Awards and he's also won um, other prestigious, prestigious awards such as Eugene Smith Award for Humanistic Photography. Um, Gideon's probably best known for the work that he's done on people suffering from AIDS um, outside of the UK. Um, today he's going to show us some of his work on an ongoing project on climate change um, which has taken on board countries which are more wealthy and countries which are poorer and showing the effect of um, similar problems problems on different um, countries. Um, he's also um, been working in Kingsmead, which is a school um, in London, uh, in one of the most deprived areas of the country. Uh, it's called the Three Eyes On Project, and it included um, working with the children and giving them cameras so that they could photograph their own lives. So, Gideon. Yes. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks. thanks for that. Um, yes, um, as Dan said, you know, I think I'm best known for my, for my work on HIV and AIDS in Africa, and <coughs> um, when, they, when they asked me to kind of take part in this and sort of somehow pre pre present an international perspective on photographing poverty, or um, I think the words we, 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 which was in, in, the, in um, the email from Flora were covering poverty, um, and I, I kind of thought, well, my initial response was that I find that quite a problematic concept, um, and you know that. And I guess I'm also at a particular point in my life and my career where I'm questioning a lot of things, questioning what I do, questioning the things we produce, and I think questioning my role as a photographer covering poverty. It's not something I perhaps feel that comfortable about, but I'm also aware that it's always 
a kind of a background drumbeat, certainly in my work on HIV and AIDS, poverty has always been somewhere in the background, you know, I mean, I think in a lot of the countries where I've been working recently, and um, my kind of latest project, which is called Through Positive Eyes, which is about p people with HIV photographing themselves, even in quite poor countries in Africa, it's quite clear that treatment is available. You know, the drugs are now quite widely available. The problems people face are sometimes being able to eat and have the right kind of diet, so kind of poverty is a huge problem, and stigma. And stigma is also very linked to education and, and poverty. So, you know, I, th I think it's an inescapable issue. Um, moving on to what I'm going I'm, I'm to quickly take you through some, some of my photographs. Um, and this, this is a project which I, I've called Drowning World. And it's, in some ways, it's kind of not very journalistic. It's about photographing. I often head to kind of scenes, and I've been, I suppose, called a bit of a, a kind of a flood vulture, kind of running around the world, getting to scenes of, of various floods. For me, very much part of this project is to work with people and engage with people in a way that they can, sh they can kind of look, address the camera and kind of show me and show the world what they are facing. Um, and I think, I think it's very much for me about uh, what began as an idea which I would try and show how the poorest people in the world are affected by climate change. Um, but the idea has grown and developed and I think it's become quite clear that you know, poor and rich countries are all going to be affected by flooding, by climate change in different kinds of ways. I think often the difference is how people in how different countries can, can, can respond. Um, so I'll take you th through a selection of images quite quickly from various countries um, that are photographed. This is in the UK. The, pre the previous pictures were in, um, in India. Um, I'm not going to say too much. I think I'll try and show a few things which hopefully will provoke some discussion. Um, um, this is just was quite an interesting situation where my my cameras, both of my, my Rodiflex cameras, managed to fall into the water, um, and uh, that's kind of become one of my favourite images. And it's quite interesting because the film and the camera were were, were also affected by by the flood waters. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little problem with sizing. So, so th th this, this is Haiti that I've been in, and we're now moving to more recent work done in, 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 in Pakistan. And central to the whole concept is the idea of people somehow addressing the camera. We've now moved to, to, to Australia. OK, now, now I'm going to move on and show you a, a, a video, which I, th I think hopefully will also kind of you know, raise a few questions. Okay. Sound isn't coming through.
I guess that, you know, that was something which is trying to address issues of wealth and poverty and I think raises questions about photographing them. And be before I go on, I mean, I'm not sure if he's here, but I just wanted to acknowledge the skills of Mo Stuber, who's the amazing and long-suffering video editor who I worked with on this project, and his input was, was crucial. And he may or may not be here. Um, I think mo moving, it, moving the discussion closer to home and I think closer to Liz's work and closer to the Save the Children project we're talking about, um, I'll show a bit of the work I've done as part of a project which I've called Three Eyes On, and there's a long story to that name, but it's a project set up by myself and Crispin Hughes, um, who sadly also can't be here, um, and it's a project dedicated to working with children in deprived communities in the UK and working with them on various projects where they photograph their own lives. And I think it's an inter interesting contrast because so far all the kids we, we worked with come from pretty poor and pretty, pretty deprived communities. Um, I've worked with kids in, in Newham, in, I mean Hackney and in, um, um, in Gateshead. And um, I'll show you a bit of, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, I'll show you a bit of a project um, done at, at Kingsmead School in Hackney. And this is a school working with some of the most deprived kids in the UK, and um, it's very closely linked to, to the Kingsmead estate, where most of the kids live. Um, and this, with this project, I, I also was photographing, and part of this video is, is a series of portraits I, I did of every kid. It was a rather mad project, photographing every single kid in the school. Um, so let me show you a bit of that. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Danielson. My mom is from Portugal and my father is from Angola. I photographed a lot of things. My sisters and family, and I photographed lots of things around Kingsmead Primary School. Hello, my name is Emma Tate and I was born in England and my mum and dad are from Jamaica. I photographed my sister and around the house. My favourite picture is the Smarty picture because I like eating Smarties. Hi, my name is Tremaine. I took a picture of the estate. I was seeing if I can find any people doing like, what they do in their everyday life. My brother is quite happy. He's, he's laughing most of the time. Hi, my name is Gianni. I made lots of pictures by the school. And my mom comes from Cuba and my dad comes from Colombia. Hi, my name is Jordan. My parents come from Congo, but I was born in London. Some photos you can make when you, you, you don't know where you get them from, but you just take it and then it just looks amazing when you look at it. I took a picture of my mum talking on the phone. This is the poem I wrote about my photograph. Each part of the Congo is part of her body. Miss you at home. I miss you in Africa where it was so hot. That necklace you gave me is all I got. You told me to be brave from the necklace you gave. Without you it's dark like a cold cave. I will be brave that is true. My words are coming from me to you. I miss the air that I breathe in Africa. I pray to God to stop malaria. I thank you for who you are. You are the person that made me go far. Each part of the Congo is part of her body. Miss you at home. My name's Melanie. I thought, just 
being so moved by Liz's pictures that I saw, I, th I, th I thought I'd just very briefly show a, a bit of, oh, okay, I was going to, but for some reason I can't open, okay, well I won't then. <laughs> I was going to show um, some pictures done um, in, in Gateshead of a very similar kind of um, landscape to the landscape you've got, which I thought would have been quite interesting. To, uh, I'll see if I, can, if, I can, if I can get it working while we start talking. It might be quite fun to come back to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Um, I think we've got a representative from Save the Children, uh, Chris, who's going to sit up here. Um, we've got some time for questions and answers, so you can also put questions to him about the project that Liz has been working on. So um, well, maybe I'll open up the questions um, in case anyone's feeling shy. Do you want me to say a few words? <coughs> oh, sorry, do you want to say a few words? No, just to... Yeah. Firstly, excuse me, I've got a cold, so I'm not quite sure if I'm shouting at you or I'm whispering at you, so <laughs> give me some kind of sense of my volume. But um, um, firstly, just to thank you for allowing us to be here today, just to say a few words as the, the, the backdrop to some of these really moving photographs. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that most people's perception of Save the Children is based on our international work. And I, mean, I think that's understandable. Over 90% of the organisation's budget is spent overseas. Um, but actually, for the best part of 100 years, we've been working to improve children's lives, both at home and abroad. Um, in 1923, our founder, Eglantine Jeb, drafted her Declaration on the Rights of the Child, which inspired today's United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. It was our research into the effects of mass unemployment on children's nutrition that paved the way for free school meals and free milk. And in the latter parts of the 20th century, uh, we worked to open up our own uh, day nurseries and playgroups. Um, now, our, um, our priority today is the campaign to eradicate child poverty by 2020 uh, and to divorce this really stubborn link between children's deprivation at home and their educational outcomes. Um, because we know that in the UK today, 3.5 million children um, are growing up in poverty. And we know that these cripplingly low incomes really damage children's childhoods, but we also know that they limit their futures as well. Um, we know that by 22 months, so just 22 months before children are two today in the UK, the effects of poverty can be seen in terms of children's development. The poorest children start at school behind their peers and the gap widens thereafter. And at Save the Children, we think no child should endure poverty um, and no child should be born without a chance. So um, thank you for inviting us today. Um, thank you for allowing us to see the very moving photographs because we know that if we're going to get government to make a real difference on this and we're going to get a change of direction and extra investment then we need to really build a movement for change which makes people angry and one of the best ways of doing that I think is capturing it in the in the way we have done today through these photographs so thank you for inviting us okay super well um, first of all I was interested Liz that um, the projects you've worked on have tended to be really long term and you've also worked very closely with the people that you photographed so I wondered, um, previously you were working on a project which is about religion, it's not about no. the fact that a family is poor. So um, when you started to work with the Jones family, how did you describe what it was you were doing and how do they feel about how they would be represented? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we were talking about this earlier and I kind of... It's yeah, it's a difficult one and as a photographer you always struggle with it, the morals and... Uh, um, and the ethics of it, but it's something that I f feel that any consent form can't really do justice really to the relationship that you have to develop individually with who you're working with and the understanding that um, you have to build. And I hope that because I work long term with people, I have an understanding enough that I'm representing them in, in a way that we're negotiating a relationship that's um, equal to be able to um, but I mean I've shown all the, the family, all the images as we've gone along and together we've been, they, I mean they're brilliant editors to be honest, they like the ones that I like too. 
Um, and I'm actually thinking about um, making some sort of uh, installation with them and making an edit which is with them and or making a sort of a family album together with them um, and actually yeah them sort of discussing showing them the photos and discussing them after <coughs> has been a real insight um, into continuing my way of working and what I'm looking for and sort of open up yeah other ideas I mean I sort of originally thought it would be so limit so sort of limited working in this very small space and with but it, it just seems to be I feel like I could keep going for a long time with it and mm. new things as I was saying new seasons open up new issues that I hadn't realized about what they can and can't do and where money is coming in factoring into this mm. um, which is yeah really interesting yeah so Gideon, like you've worked in a similar way to Liz before, like photographing other people, but um, in Kingsmead you've chosen to um, give children their own cameras. Why did you decide you wanted to take that tack? Well, I mean, I think um, you know it's it's been a process for me of kind of uh, the last couple of years of engaging with I suppose, the field the field of collaborative photography, and it um, I mean it began with me partly kind of reaching a point with my work on HIV and AIDS where I felt I had nothing left to say as a photographer and um, I, I began a project called Through Positive Eyes which I felt was time to hand the camera back to HIV positive people and that it was time to kind of see what kind of images and, and, and uh, in a way I was more inter interested in seeing the kind of images which HIV positive people would, would take of themselves in their own lives than the images I could take. I mean that, that is something that's a point I got to after I suppose 17 years of working as a photographer on the, on, on the issue um, and I mean I think I, for me the results have, have been quite extraordinary and then I think it, 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 the same a similar kind of thing kind of began with me uh, and, and Crispin kind of and for, for a variety of reasons, I began an engagement you know, with, through, through having kids myself. And in fact, when, when my son was six, I began seeing the kind of photographs he could take. And I thought it would be very interesting to work with schools. And I began working initially with Kingsmead School. And in a way, it, we'd helped, that helped Chris and I develop a model for the project, which we call Three Eyes On, where we've, we've now worked in schools across the UK. Um, and I think it's for me. It's, I, I'm just so excited to see the kind of images kids take over their own lives, <coughs> and you know, I think, I mean, Liz, you've achieved amazing access and amazing intimacy. But one, one thing I've, I've always kind of felt is that no photographer can achieve that the kind of access to lives of poverty than a, a poor kid actually can themselves. You know, and, and and seeing the kind of images which are produced when kids. I think w what we try and do is kind of switch them on to the idea of a camera as being not something you pose for, but something you use to explore your life, something which can be a tool to explore your life. Your life. And once kids get, get enthusiastic about that, I've really been just am amazed by, by, by the results. And, um, you know, and some, there have been some quite shocking images, and sometimes images which you know, a lot of the kind of organizations who've, who we've worked with, who have commissioned us, haven't always felt they're comfortable with. Um, but you know, it's, it's amazing what, what kids can actually say about can can say about their lives. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in actually kind of following up on an issue which, which you raised, Liz, was the, the two different families, the family mm. who you, you which you felt wasn't working for you. And mm. my understanding is that they didn't look poor, that, that the images were not strong enough. They didn't look they didn't look to poor be enough. Fair, yeah, and, it was and, very difficult to to visually translate the issues that they were facing. Facing, and and my, I guess my kind of challenge for you, as I say, of the children, I mean, is with, with, with Liz perhaps anticipating your needs. I mean, do you feel? Those those images don't work as well, that, that 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 you need the sort of more extreme, more shocking images which Liz took, and and the, and the other images of less interest to you. I mean, do, do you feel the same? I mean, how how would you respond to those two? I mean, I, I think we want to represent the reality of, of people's lives, and um, we know that there are a number of mediums that we can try and communicate our messages through. I mean, um, just the use of statistics to show people. Um, some of the gross injustices some children face um, alongside the photographs of, of, of people's lives. We don't need to, you know, we don't need to edit or fabricate child poverty in the UK today. I mean, it's there and it's dark and we can see it if we walk five minutes down the road. Um, so, no, we want to show the reality of people's lives and we want to put that message across with statistics and in the most powerful way we can to try and make change. Um, but sorry to press you, 
on, 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 on the issue. Do you feel um, the first family? I mean, I, I personally, I felt that one, the one picture with the, the, the kids outside in their, in their jackets mm. was very moving and tender and, and quite beautiful and, and said a lot to me, you know, about poverty, you know, I mean... Really? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, mean, I, 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 I you know, I mean, I mean in a, in a, so, but, 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 my, but, but following through on that, my question to you is, I mean, do, do you kind of agree with, 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 with Liz's decision that the one family didn't look uh, kind of yeah. poor enough. So, 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 yeah. Partly that, but also partly, partly that I felt about the relationship that we, you know, it wasn't an, a fair enough relationship. You know, I was meant to be representing them and they wanted me to come in and sell their story in a positive way. And if I really was to do that, I was just going to take too much of their family time. I was going to be obtrusive and I was, it wasn't. You know, I just, it just wasn't, I don't know, you have this feeling as a photographer, and I knew when I went into the Jones family that this was just going to work. <coughs> and I just, yeah, and I'm very, you know, pleased that when I met with Joe, that Joe, um, who was helping me, the editor on this project, respected that, that choice, and we sort of mm. decided together. Yeah. Joe's um, in the audience, yeah, and I think actually, she wants to speak um, up. It's yeah. not really fair to ask Chris to answer this question, because he hasn't been involved in the photography side of it, right. really. He's really here as a specialist to talk about UK poverty. Right. Um, as far as the project's concerned, we're working with six different photographers, and they're very different kinds of stories. And you've got the extreme of the Joneses. You've got other people who are more mainstream. And I think for us, it was to show that it's not what you think it is. It's not necessarily the people you think it is, and to show that full spectrum of how people are affected by poverty, um, and not to stereotype. And yeah, Liz is for us in the Jab family is an interesting family as well, but I respected Liz's, you know, interest in the Jones family and that was working really well and like she said it was about a relationship and it was a very strong relationship she was with the Jones's family and that was a decision we took to And I think we both kind of <laughs> agreed that the images were stronger. I really didn't feel I was doing very good images the other and yeah. we felt that it would be more useful I think because in the end we do you know, the images are to be made for the audience to respond to, and if... Yeah, it, but if, are, it yeah. wasn't the extreme of poverty when you look at across the spectrum of all the photographers' work, which Liz unfortunately hasn't had the opportunity to, no. yeah, because some are, you know, you wouldn't see poverty in the pictures. Right, it's more I guess about that's what my... we put next to them, because I think that is the challenge, and that's what we need to get across, that there isn't just the stereotype. Mm. It affects so many people in so many different ways, and I think the project's trying to do that as well. So, yeah. <laughs> And I think that the builds on that around the, some of the inequalities that we see in education, which, um, you know, in some respects you can, you can look as if you've got a perfectly working education system with rising average scores. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a silent phenomenon that actually, you know, the poorest children do worse and make less progress at every stage. So how you represent that is very difficult, but sometimes yeah. it's, a, it's a phenomenon that, um, you know, isn't particularly apparent. It was a quite be um, beautiful uh, moment I had with one of them one day, and they were getting out there. They were really proud to show me their uh, school certificates. And I think, I don't know what it was, it be, would it be in GCSE? I don't know if it was GCSEs. But you get lots, I remember, because you do like 11 or something. And you know, she was really pleased to show me these. And I looked, and they were, you know, oh, great, you know, loads of them. And then I looked at the grades, and they were, you know, Ds and Es and Fs. And she was still so proud of these and didn't, you know, but that, and I'm aware with it within the, the others that there's a lot of difficulty in, at school and, um, yeah, and I'm sure that it's due to the situation. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, one <coughs> issue that I thought, um, it's an interesting question for you, but it might be harder for you to answer than Gideon. Um, is um, the viewer's um, reading of the images. Um, so say, for example, um, poor people in this country are, are not always looked at in a sympathetic way. Mm. So did you feel that was something quite difficult for you to, to, to photograph people who, there's lots of pejorative terms about people who are mm. poorer and who live in crowded houses and don't do well in school? Yeah, it's sort of, but I like, it's a kind of good challenge because I, um, to get through to do something new on a subject which I think poverty has been maybe not at the moment in the UK but has been you know, covered so much and um, people are aware of the stereotypes that people eat from Iceland and mm. no fresh food and 
um, and this family actually fits into a lot of those stereotypes um, mm. but there's a story that's ignored because of that I think and issues and that's something that I hope as the project goes on um, that I can make an edit that will express other things will come out mm. um, as well as showing that these are there but there are maybe they're covering other things yeah if that answers yeah <laughs> So Gideon, you've, sh you've shot sort of poorer people in various parts of the world. Do you think it's almost harder to shoot poorer people in the UK? Um, I think perhaps it's harder to define what, what poverty is mm. um, in the UK. And, and I think often abroad in Africa and in the Asian places I've worked, poverty is, it's, and deprivation is, is often kind of very, very clear. Um, whereas, you know, I think sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll encounter people, and certainly in my experience in this country, you'll encounter people who have got a huge television set in their room and a impressive looking lounge suite, but the kids aren't eating properly. And, and you know, and I think, I th I think yeah. that, that, that often is it's, it's quite confusing. And often, I think then making images which tell, tell that story is often hard to do because the images can, you know, you know, someone would say, well, that isn't poverty, they've got a bigger television set than me, so, you know, why should I care, why should I be concerned about, um, you know, so I, th I think it's, uh, I, th I think in a way the family you photographed, the images are quite extreme and quite clear and quite, you know, you, you can't really argue in a way with, with that being a, a very clear depiction of, of a very poor, poor family. But I think with, with many, many other situations, it's much, it's much more kind of nuanced, so it's harder, harder mm -hmm. to do. Um, um, but I, th I think, you know, certainly there is, a, you know, in, in, my, in my experience of working with kids in, in, in these countries, the, you know, just seeing the, the images coming back from the kids, you know, often we've, we've, we've just been quite shocked by kind of what what we've seen, you know, the, the, the kind of conditions, the kind of lives you see. So it's, it's not far off, and I think I certainly agree with you, there's mm -hmm. a large amount of poverty here, and it's very easy to ignore because it's often, it's often quite, quite hidden and quite sort of, you know, I don't know, yeah, disguised. It's, it's, just really, it's really difficult to understand, and I'm still trying to understand, understand what it means. I mean, when they told me that they, they were offered larger accommodation, but they turned it down, and I was like, oh. Okay, uh, and then people aren't gonna. Is that a story that we can tell? You know, is, but actually, the reason is because this is the first house they've ever had, um, and it means so much to them that they really don't want to leave, mm. um, and that they, you know, and that's something that's difficult to, uh, yeah, mm. sort of things are sort of coming out, and yeah, um, so yeah, it's hard to translate the, these issues in the images if I'm still. Understand this, understand it after being with them for a few months. You know? mm, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've, I've you know, know some kids who got housing, you know, much better housing off the Kingsmead estate, and desperately miss. You know, firstly that they often they feel quite threatened. You know, they felt safe on the estate, and you know, living in a, in a, in a bigger house elsewhere, actually. F Miss, you know, miss the life, miss the community, and, and actually feel quite threatened, and, and feel kind of moving away to a bigger place actually has, you know, hasn't helped them at all. You know, so it's, it's, it, it can be confusing, and, and I, th I think, I mean, maybe it also challenges, you know, I think issues of, of kind of us as sort of patronising or you know, as kind of middle class concerned wealthier people kind of photographing poverty and maybe kind of photographing it I mean, I mean for me both elsewhere but and and over here I think it, it does challenge all of those notions and you know what our role what you know what what can we do I mean I, I guess for you guys at, at say the children you know all of those issues must 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 be quite prevalent with, with, with this project yeah, Chris or maybe Joe in the audience as well. How do you handle showing photographs of people taken in the UK, and how do you ensure that um, they're read? I suppose again, like on message, according to the way that you want them to be received. Um, I think. I mean, I think this is what this um, 
talks about as well is what Gideon's saying, that it's very difficult because it's kind of almost invisible property. Some, sometimes it's very difficult to show just in pictures without captions and things like that. So we, we do a lot of first-person first case studies, interviews, multimedia pieces, and things that can explain the story in a bigger way than just the one picture kind of stereotyping or extreme, as you're saying. But it's incredibly difficult because there's not sympathy in the same way as there is, say, for pictures of poverty in Africa. But I mean, I, I guess I mean, having worked a lot with with NGOs and in, in, you know various NGOs over the years, I mean, I think I think there's a particular kind of demand. I mean, I mean and, and I don't know if you agree with that. That there's a certain that there's a demand for a certain kind of story, you know, a story which shows poverty, which can you know shock perhaps shock people to some extent, but there also needs to be something positive. There's also often a demand that there's some kind of positive angle as well, so people can f feel that if they give money, there's it's, it's, it's constructive and you know, mm. the right thing to do. So they, they often have very particular kind of needs which uh, kind of us photographers as kind of the creators of kind of I suppose visual commodities for organizations can feel pressurized to produce. I mean, do you, do you, I mean, do, do you feel you have a very particular kind of thing you need? I think Chris would say in the UK we, we don't raise a lot of money off the back of say UK property. We, we use it for advocacy a lot, a lot of our material right. to campaign against government to make changes because it's not really a fundraiser, it's not, right. you know, in, in the same that like, international incidents or issues are. No. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have you know very clear asks of the government, and we're trying to build a movement right. um, of people that will demand change, so that to back up our lobbying and our advocacy to try and create a situation whereby uh, we do end child poverty and we do um, end the gaps in children's educational outcomes at every stage of childhood. So, you know, it's very much about you know what can what can help us make the strongest case we can. I'm just interested to ask why you've um, decided to work on this project right now. Um, well, I am j joking, perhaps coming after me. I mean, our UK program now is is really growing. Um, we've got a number of programs, uh, programs that work with parents to help them, uh, to support them while they're helping their children learn, programs that support um, the poorest young people and families to campaign for change in their communities. We've got a crisis grant program for families that have really slipped through the net and need kind of carpets for babies to crawl on or cookers for fresh food to be prepared in the home. Um, and our UK program is now really gathering momentum and we want to build on those programs to have a strong policy and advocacy base and really to try and make change. Um, and I think this is an important aspect of that, but Joe jo may have more, more to add. Uh, I guess it's, as Chris was saying, it's, it's kind of we're moving into more work in UK poverty, but also it's the current economic climate. There's a greater divide now. There's more people in that grouping of people who are living in poverty or have, is about barriers and barriers to opportunities in life that other people have. And it's an increasing barrier. And I think very much at the moment when I kind of looked at it or looked at it within my team, we felt there wasn't much photography as a collective out there. And I know it's a great project you're doing good in. It's really good to see other people doing stuff. But people's voices weren't getting out there. And very much the human story wasn't getting out there. It was very tabloid kind of papers. and. We wanted to get a more human, intimate story, and across the whole UK, which is why we used six photographers to do that. So it was a timing, and as far as we felt, it was kind of a changing landscape, really. And we wanted to look at visual representation of poverty as well at the moment in the UK. So, are there any other questions in the audience? I'm really interested in hearing you talking about the use for advocacy because I think it's, it's probably one of the only ways that you get away from the, the moral issues that, that Gideon has said. And I'd be really interested to know how you, you'd actually use the work of your six photographers, including Liz's, to actually target specific targets uh, for advocacy and, and to possibly change the government's policy on uh, access to education or, or any other ways to actually break the link between educational deprivation. I mean, do you have specific targets? Uh, do you brief your photographers? Um, how do you organise it? <coughs> um, 
each photographer is working in a particular area which we know is a big issue in the UK at the moment. So Liz is overcrowded housing, others will be working around education and that. We are um, taking it to all the um, assemblies and parliaments. Um, we're going to have an opening where we have MPs and that there as well. So we'll be kind of petitioning the work at them, but we'll use that work going forward for the next year or two within our work around campaigning and that. So um, we're going to use it quite widely and hopefully it will hit to those people with the profile of it. And it's also about getting the UK public on board of those issues as well, so that you know there's a, the UK public are interested in challenging the government on those issues as well. Um, I mean, to, to, to what extent do you sort of kind of demand a certain kind of thing? I mean, I mean uh, do, is it, do, do you ask for something quite particular from your photographers? I mean, how, how open is the brief? How, how kind of... You know. um, it's been a very open brief, as Liz would say. It's been very much... We, we kind of worked with photographers um, who had a kind of connection to the area or something. So Liz grew up in Birmingham and that. We wanted someone who connect, could connect as an individual and could go in a bit deeper with those people. Abby Trailer Smith did Wells because she grew up in Wells as well. So the photographers had an interest in those areas. And it's been open. There's been discussion between us and I've given them all the stats and all the issues that we, we know are in those areas. And then they've gone in and they've kind of just got to know those families and just telling the lives of those families, really. So it's a very open brief. Yeah, I mean, just to back that up, I feel it's been really just sort of said, you know, you chose the photographers because you liked the way that we work, I think, and you've seen our work and you knew, and you really just let it open. You said, this is our, this is the project and this is the issues we're trying to raise. Go and do your thing kind of thing. That's what it felt like and that's been amazing to be able to do. And as we said, we've had, you know, throughout the project different changes and choosing the families and 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 visual style and that's we've really kind of worked on it together but you've really respected how I wanted to you know this project um, to be and it feels very much my project um, yeah. so um, I believe that the project ultimately you want to make an exhibition out of it but also to um, get coverage in the media I wondered how will you handle um, if the images are taken up by a, a magazine or a newspaper how are you going to um, control or try to influence the way that they're used? Um, I think that would just be a good discussion with the picture editors on the magazines and that. You know, I mean, you do get that affinity um, and discussion around it. So we would, you know, make sure we wouldn't publish it unless we felt comfortable with what they were doing. Hi, there's a question here. Probably a bit of a slightly sillier question, but it's kind of it's aimed at both of you guys and being photographers that deal with such issues, like quite hard line issues sometimes. And obviously, the example that I'm thinking of with you, Liz, is um, when you when you're dealing with situations like that. So you're in, in dealing with a, a very a very poor family. Uh. And it's a situation like where the you said the the, the money went off on the TV, and you, but you're there sort of documenting. Do you ever feel like a need to step in sometimes? I know, mm. obviously, we're surrounded by all these Vietnam. Uh, photographs and, that, and a lot of the photographers just take a step back and being a press photographer myself I take a step back and don't get involved in any of the scenes but you build up such relationships with these people especially the family that you said you, you know you really enjoy going to see them sometimes you've built a really deep relationship so when there is a problem say like she can't have the money to have her teeth done and, and this simple the simpler thing of like having a pound to put in the TV do you ever feel the need to just go well no. You don't, you take no, a step back, you I hold just, the line. I don't know, I just feel that that's not... You need to draw the line and kind yeah. of be who but, you are. But, you know, on well, their birthdays, I, we made cakes together and I bought the cake yeah. material and things like that, but yeah. I think otherwise their life has to go on how it, we're, I'm... It's not my place. You have to be a goat, you have to kind of just go yeah. in there, not as a goat, but, you know, but just kind of... There has to be a line where you just go, you know, because I've, I've been tempted on jobs and sometimes you just go, well, you know, you know here's a... A fiver, just yeah. you know, da, 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 go and do what you've got to do, you know. And it, it's different because obviously I, I work closely in communities all the time, and it's we're always constantly involved with them. And it's you know, it's just for a local sort of press. But I have, I always have thought, and I always try and draw a line, especially when it comes to sort of you know, sort of accidents and things like that. When it comes to crime, and that you just you know, you do draw the line. And but occasionally, you, you, I break, you know, you break mm. kind of thing. But you just keep it. You just kind I of. S I don't. With all my work, I try not to get to. Is very much. Yeah. But I try and. Um, 
yeah, trying to get to, but the, um, actually I learned quite a bit on the, on the previous project and doing that. And, you know, all the communities I were living so close together and I was, they really knew, were not involved in each other's lives at all. And at the beginning, my real aim was to show this kind of multi-faith living environment. Um, but that wasn't happening. They just weren't engaging, so I couldn't right. force what wasn't there. But, and... I, I, well, as I said, I lived in um, a lot of them, and I lived in the Hare Krishna um, temple, and I actually became a nun for five days and wore all white, which was an amazing experience, um, which was actually in one of the pictures, the back, when you saw them in the window fixing yeah. it. Um, and I also lived with the, uh, with the Jesus Army, uh, which was yeah, quite an overwhelming experience as well, but completely different. And they live three doors down from each other in two huge houses and they and I'd lived in both of them at different pit times and they had no each no idea that each other existed or what lives were being lived there and I was so intrigued by this and they were both such lovely uh, people and I knew that they would you know kind of get on so yeah. so they were the only people I introduced um, and it was fine. They were, you know, very respectful to each other. They were really interested, but I know they'll never see each other again. Oh, okay. And I, but I just, you know, when I, when I sort of, because um, they, you know, I told them I lived in each other, so they did ask me, you know, or would be like, interested to meet them. So it wasn't I just forced them together. Um, but I felt when I did it, I was like, that just, that was weird. Yeah. That wasn't right. You took a step. You felt yeah, like you stepped too a little far. Bit. Okay, not, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. But you, but you feel like, you know, you said you like make cakes, and so you've kind of you've given them sort of an emotional trade. It was like, you know, I'm here, I'm doing this, but it's kind of like I will involve myself a little bit with your life rather than just being this photographer. You know, you will sort of get on with them, get a rapport, and you know, sort of participate in events that they take. Yeah. And, you know, to that. But also, get it yeah. with you well, as well. Have you I ever mean, had a situation? I, th I think. I mean, obviously, less so in this work I've shown now, but certainly in my work on HIV and AIDS, that's. You know, it's been a, been, a, been, a, been a constant issue and a constant problem, and sure. I think I've, I've, I've constantly done the wrong. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, if, if the wrong thing is to get involved and try to help people beyond photographing and taking the photographs back, sure. I have frequently, you know, got over involved, and you know, and and it's, sometimes it's the wrong, thing, right thing to do. Sometimes it's been completely, completely the wrong thing, but in, yeah. in, it's, it's often a very difficult situation. I mean, I, I've, I've worked a lot with Lawrence from Action Aid in the back then, and I know it's, an action, action, it's quite a strict Action Aid sort of principle that when you visit projects, you don't involve. Well, you, you don't open up your pocket and try and give something to kind of poor people who, who you're in, encountering. And for very good reason, because that can make things very difficult for, for, for visitors later on. It's a very understandable thing. Yeah. But I have to confess that sometimes I have broken the rules. Yeah. Um, you know, sorry, Lawrence. <laughs> um, not, not as badly as others, but you know, so, uh, sometimes I, ha I have just found it impossible. And in other situations, I've got over, you know, in, I've got caught up in trying to, you know, bring, you know, sick, you know, sick, sick children with HIV, you know, just trying to, you know, see if I could get them onto tree. You know, I've, I have got over involved in some situations, sure. which probably hasn't always been the best idea, but, uh, but uh, one doesn't always do the right thing or the wrong thing. You never quite know what yeah, it when is. When you're in a situation, and you find it yes, sometimes yes, you're like, oh. you, know, you, know, you know, sometimes I, and I, th I thought, I can't actually live, live with myself if I, if I just walk out of here with, with only my photographs. Yeah. Um, I guess and, so uh, yours are a little bit more yeah, 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 you know, it's, 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 yeah. extreme than me and my pounds on the TV. Yes, it's a different kind of, kind of situation. Um, but I, th I think the process for me, and, and, and again, it's in relation to kind of journalism, is that I think one thing that happened to me over my kind of 18 years or so of photographing HIV and AIDS is that I th through being quite affected by the situations and the people I photographed, it's something which I, I very find very hard to put down. You know, it wasn't something, you know, when I finished, published my, first, my, my book on the issue in 2001, I kind of continued working on the subject. And I suppose uh, the accusation has been, has been made that, you know, <coughs> it was the end of me as a photojournalist, my engagement with HIV and AIDS, and I became more of an activist and became more kind of socially involved. Um, and you know, my, my work over the last 10 years has been very much, often a lot of it done in collaboration with orga organizations like, like the Treatment Action Campaign in South Africa, has been quite focused on making, I suppose, what I call tools of visual advocacy and becoming involved more, you know, less as a commissioned photographer than a, as an advocate. And maybe that's, yeah. again, stepping over the line of being a, being a photographer and a photojournalist. And, but, I th but I think also in the kind of media world of today, 
I think all those kinds of lines are being broken and I think the, the, well the, even the, in the Vietnam this, War it really yeah, did yeah, it became yes. more of a point of kind of showing people what's going on and then you yeah. then as you said you, you stepped the line you've become you're, you're championing their point and you know what's yeah, going yes, so, so, when, so I, th- I think all, all, all of those things are really up oh. for kind of renegotiation kind of re, re, rethinking at the moment do you, do you think that that has changed your photography though you know you say that it was the end of you as a photojournalist and then well as I said the ac- that, that accusation has been has been made and I have mixed yeah. feelings about whether okay, that's true or not but, um, but I mean I, th- I, th- I think certainly you know it was a d- very different kind of engagement and I mean my role now with the Through Positive Eyes project is very much as a kind of a project leader and I'm not well I, I'm shooting portraits and I'm shooting video on the project but the main bulk of the photography on the Through Positive Eyes project is being done by HIV positive people and you know we, we just were talking about an exhibition that's going to happen of the work in Los Angeles and I was adamant that you know I'd my work, my, my portraits have to be a lot, lot smaller than, 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 than the subject pictures because even though I'm a better known photographer, their work is, is, is central to, to, to that project. Um, but I, and I suppose also for me, my engagement with, with collaborative photography is also about that as working in different kinds of ways and mm. trying to find different forms of collaboration with people, diff- different ways of photographing and not always being the kind of big outside photographer going in. I think, Gideon, in the past, though, you've also mentioned that there were times when you had to just put the camera down and not take the photograph. Um, I wonder if you could say more about that and also if you thought about that issue as well with the Jones family. So maybe Gideon first. Um, well, the times when I have and I haven't, and, and I mean, I suppose, I mean, the, uh, one example, is, is, I mean, a long time ago, an, an, an early kind of ex- example, when I, my first kind of project, when I began photographing HIV and AIDS, I was, I spent a couple of weeks photographing in an AIDS, an AIDS ward in, in London for the, the, um, the Positive Lives project, um, which was something which happened with, with network photographers a long time ago, and I, I spent a couple of weeks in a very tense environment, and it was the first time they had allowed a photographer in, in, into a ward, and, and there was a feeling that the HIV world was, was very closed, and you know that ward. They, they previously had, you know, been, been opened by Princess Di. There'd been, you know, photographers trying to climb in the windows. You know, there was had such a huge stigma and so much prurient interest, and kind of allowing a photographer in. There was a huge bond of trust which, which had, to be, had, to, had to be built, and I could only photograph people who really clearly agreed to, agreed to be photographed. And I, I saw some incredible things. I mean, there was, uh, uh, there was a guy. There was a. A Ugandan refugee there, and I, I just remember a scene where he was being—he was very sick, and he, and he was—he was—he was kind of dying of HIV and AIDS, and he had a body which was covered in torture scars, and they, they, they brought an X-ray machine into the ward, and there was this kind of light shining on it on his body. I mean, I, I just saw a scene there which was, which was like a remarkable scene, and I had my cameras there, and I was just being completely aware that there was no way I could even consider lifting my camera to make what would have been a great picture because. He wasn't someone who had agreed to be photographed, and in fact, he was not someone who the the, the ward sisters felt I couldn't I couldn't even approach, you know. So it was very very kind of mediated. Mm. I mean, another situation was when my response was kind of different. I, I was photographing in a in a in a, in a, a hospital in the Matibi district of, of Zimbabwe, and I'd agreed with the director of the hospital, Dr. Ashwandan, who was trying to set up a, a, a home care project that my pictures could be used for. for for fundraising, which he was doing in Switzerland, and um, there were a couple of patients who had agreed to be photographed, and I, I was working working with them and photographing them. And I was photographing one of the patients, um, and there was just a moment when his wife was lifting him him up to make him more comfortable. And there was actually a family visit happening at the time, and he kind of had a, a spasm and sort of died from kidney failure while, while I was photographing. And there was a, a kind of a moment there where. I initially began photographing ins- instinctively, and then when I realised what was happening, and the families were kind of, kind of, you know, the, the wife was screaming, and there was a whole chaotic situation happening. I put my camera down. And I was confused. I didn't quite know what to do. And and Dr. Ashwandan, who was nearby, and ca- he came along and he saw me put the camera down, and he sort of, in the midst of that chaos, he kind of looked at me and said, "Come on, man, do your job." Um, and I think that was partly kind of him saying to me, you know, you've chosen to put yourself in this situation. You're not a doctor. You're not, you're not, a, you're not a nurse. And the only thing you can do is photograph. Um, mm. So those you yeah, expose different kinds of. Do you think there's ever a time though when you've um, not taken a photograph because it was off message as an advocate? So you're you're advocating on a certain message. Um, I mean that's 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 an interesting question. I mean I, I think there were, there were times a long long time ago in South Africa when when I was photographing um, 
in, 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 the, in, the, in the 1980s, there were one or two situations where I was in town, there were funerals, there were events happening, where things happened, where I, you know, you know, I, I, I was close to a situation once where, where someone was was necklaced. You know, that, that was a situation where, within black communities, people who were accused of being informers were, um, you know, had had, had a, a burning tire put around put put around their heads, and there was a kind of a clutch of photographers kind of photographing that, and I didn't feel comfortable taking that picture, partly because I suppose I was an activist at the time, and I, I, I felt that wasn't, I was working for Agence France Press, and, I, and that was an image which I felt I wanted to be going out to the world, and I didn't feel comfortable with the way other people were, mm. were photographing it. So there were some situations, I guess, like that mm. in my past, but that was a long, long time ago. Mm. Liz, how about you? Did you feel there were some things that you didn't want to photograph? Um, I was just thinking about it when you were saying. Um, I, I don't think so. I haven't come across that feeling as yet, but I'm sure, as I said, it's very much a work in progress and I haven't really found exactly, for me, outside of Snow Visual, but this project for me, really what I'm story is right to tell um, of them yet. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure it'll be in the editing process, it'll be quite clear that maybe some images are just not right, mm -hmm. uh, not because they visually aren't powerful, it's often the most powerful sometimes that you take out because it's not um, representing them how I feel that um, they should be, we should be represented mm. or that the story is being told so I think it'd be, it'd be more in that way but you know also I'm sure that if another photographer went in they would take completely different photographs and be drawn to different scenes than I'm drawn to so yeah. I, you know you do it subconsciously I think you yeah um, Mm. Putting you on the spot. I mean, if, if 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 you were photographing and they were comfortable with you photographing, but there was a scene of some sort of domestic violence in the household, w w w w would there be a moment where you might think, okay, well, I shouldn't, yeah. I shouldn't photograph um, this. I mean, it's not. I think I I sort of wanted to work with this family as well because I realised that wasn't the story there to be told, um, and I think that yeah, it would be a different. I don't think I would have chosen, if there was domestic violence in there, I don't think I would have, what's so special about this family is the, despite the kind of stereotype on the surface, there's so much love and other thing, other stories to come out and I think, well I, I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be domestic violence in this family if there was, no I'd probably, I'd be probably so su surprised that I probably wouldn't have picked up my camera and photographed it. Mm -hmm. um, so, Joe, how do you work with the photographers to edit their work? I mean, I guess that's all in the future, but... Yeah, it is yeah. in the future at the moment, just not in edit, so... Um, we'll be doing it jointly with the photographers, and obviously looking... We will be looking at the kind of stories that are coming out, and like Liz is saying, working out what, what are the right pictures. We also will be trying to avoid extreme stereotypes within that, because we won't want to show people in the wrong, wrong way as well, you know, so it'll be a balance, but, yeah, we'll be yeah. doing that with the photographers. Just question for Liz. Uh, just curious, how did you find the two families that you did photograph? Was that an introduction through Save the Children or no, through your own um, contacts? Actually, we, at the beginning, sort of Save the Children said they didn't really have many contacts within the area that I wanted to work, and I also felt I would like to find the families myself because I felt that it was had to be a really relationship, and it's not easy, you know, to get a large family, all of the family agreeing that they're happy for you to hang around all the time, and so it was quite, it was quite amazing to find the Jones family really, um, and as I said, both were through some of the educational work I did. So, um, on the Under Gods project, um, I ran an. And, uh, some workshops and I went around uh, in Wolverhampton because it had an exhibition there and with young people from the local area we went around different religious buildings with cameras and um, through that actually there were a number of families I could have worked with um, from people but I particularly connected with one of the girls uh, Michelle on that project and she was also really keen on photography and so it was through that that I went back to her family and it kind of came from there but it was you know really amazing and lucky that it's worked and the other family that I've been doing an artist a residency in a nursery school near Soho Road again so these are kind of interlinked um, and I met the family through the nursery school there
sorry, and just on a practical level, like how much time do you actually spend? Do you actually live with the family, or are you sort of going away and kind of coming back fresh? I mean, it must be. Yeah, just... I actually haven't spent that many days there. I think it's about five, six, five or six. Um, but it's so intense. Like for the first, you know, this project, I. I don't really use any of the images for the first six months I shot, which is really painful to think about now. And, you know, if at the time, if someone had told me that, I would have just gone, oh, I'm giving up. Um, but it was just so long to sort of understand, really. We had so many different communities, whereas here it's sort of all, it's almost too much. And at the beginning, I was, you know, sort of overwhelmed. And it, and it was really easy to just take all the... Yeah, the really obvious pictures, and now it's sort of I'm seeing as it's changing, and I, um, yeah, but I basically, yeah, going back to your question anyway, I, I kind of have this sort of routine of how I do it, and I, I go for the day. I don't go too early because they're not early risers, and I've realised there's actually not so much happens before uh, sort of 11 o'clock, and also they might get annoyed with me hanging around with them in bed. Um, I did sort of initially discuss with them me staying over, and I thought that would be really important, but then I kind of realised that I didn't need to experience that. Just being with them in the day um, was going to be enough, I felt. Um, but yeah, it feels very intense and I'm always exhausted when I come out because the house is so alive all the time. You can imagine with five rooms with um, yeah, seven young people and two parents, it's pretty manic um, and sort of quite draining. There's stuff going on all the time. Um, so yeah, but I, I'm always taking far, yeah, I'm amazed at how many rolls of film that I shoot when I'm there because there's just <coughs> so much going on. Um, yeah. I think there was another question, yep. Yeah. Hi, for Liz, um, do you have a kind of an idea of who the audience is for these photos and when you're taking them and what you want them to feel? And I suppose generally, can one single photo express poverty without con contextualising text or anything else around it? Um, we could probably both answer that last one. Um, about, I think it's very difficult. Yeah. And I think, you know, images have been used in the past in that way, and I think it can be um, limiting for. Um, well, I mean, I, th I, th I think, I mean, I, th I think yes and no, <laughs> you know, in the answer to that. I mean, I, th I think uh, an amazing picture should be able to say a, l a lot with, with, without words. Although, I mean, my journey, certainly in HIV and AIDS, and a lot of the work, uh, um, well, it's in, in my work in HIV and AIDS, I've really felt the work needed words, and increasingly I've used sound and lots of multimedia components because it was almost too hard and too shocking without the words and the stories behind it were important. But in my work on flooding, which I showed you now, I actually found, although I recorded interviews, I've actually found that the words don't add much to what you see in the pictures. You know, someone saying, my house has been destroyed, doesn't actually add much to when you, when, you, when, you, when you see the destroyed house. So I think it depends very much on the context and the kind of... And, and I think, you know, from my own experience, issues around HIV are often so complex that getting personal stories linked to the images yeah. really, really helps and helps to kind of put it all together. But it, it, it's, it's not the case, the case for everything in my, in my experience. I mean, in my work with kids or the Three Hours On project, I just love the sound of kids' voices and kids telling their own stories and explaining, explaining their pictures. Yeah. Could you yeah. just repeat that first question again? <laughs> it was just about whether you have a, a clear idea of who the audience oh. is and um. what you want them to feel when you're actually taking the photographs. Well, because I'm so aware of how my feelings in that place have changed since when I first went in and this kind of initial shock and, you know, I had to get over myself, really. It was difficult to sit down and... Um, yeah, feel relaxed, and I obviously look like a lemming, you know, in this place. Um, and so it's taken a while, so, but now I'm just so comfortable, I just go in and, you know, just get on with it the day I know what happens. But then, and then I'm kind of surprised when I show people some of the pictures sometimes, and they're so shocked again, like I was initially about the peeling wallpaper and things, and I don't see it anymore. Um, and it is really important to me as I do this edit to really show. Well, not too much, but show, share the images with people to, to for lots of different 
um, yeah, people who aren't photographers and who are, to see people's reactions to them, because you're, because I, mine has changed so much, um, and to see what they're reading from them now. Um, I don't have a particular audience at all. I hope that it can speak to a lot of people and different people can read different things from it. I think the idea is that they are used with substantial text as well, is that right? Yeah, I mean, they would normally be used with, as you say, contextualised, but um, certainly powerful in themselves. So. And are, are, the, are the, words, the words of the subjects or the words of people write, writing about them? I think that would depend. I think it could be either. I mean, it could be people's quotes, or it could be um, it could be some just some data about the the circumstance. So it would just depend. Um, yeah, Flora. I don't know if it's possible. I just thought it might be quite interesting for me to show because the two kids' stories from Newcastle we occupy quite similar sort of landscapes to those kids. It might be just quite interesting to very briefly sort of show those and. It, 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 could, could, could be interesting to see how. I think it might be interesting to see how kids, photo, kids from mm. similar kind of kind of families, photo, have photographed. Um, I'll just briefly take take you through two. Mm -hmm. no, no, I don't think so. I think it's fine. Okay, give us a minute. I mean, I'll, I'll just show two. I mean, in in. in with this project at, at um, in in Bencham in Newcastle, we, we worked with, the, with 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 poetry as well. So there's so there's, so it's the kids' photographs and the and the poems, which are used. Um. Ah, okay, give us a second. Sorry about that. Um, because I'm, I'm I mean I'm I'm, I'm I, I guess. It, it, okay. Um, I think that's. There's something from this, the screen thing you need to... That's you, okay. My daddy's cool and um, he wakes up chop well and carries stuff about. Waiting for so long, Dad going out to work, just waiting. Waiting for so long, Dad can't be late, just waiting. Waiting for so long, for some cash, just waiting. Examining the inbox and gazing in the mirror and dreaming. interesting kind of contrast there's. So the photograph of the young girl with the phone, was that a photograph she's taking of herself to put online? No, oh. no, 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 that's all yeah. kind of take pictures taken by the kids. Yeah. Have the guys who are photographing got family photo albums that have you been able to look at them? No, they don't have that on. Um, 
do they take photographs themselves on, mm. on phones or...? Yeah, a little bit. And actually, this is something that I'm going to now do with them. I think I'm going to hand over some cameras to them as well. I'm not sure how it's going to work within my project, but mm. I think it's just going to be really interesting, yeah, um, to see what will happen. And I'm not sure where mm. it's going to go. Yeah, but, yeah. Mm. Well, unless there's any more questions, maybe. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Getting back to the, the previous question that was asked to you before, before the videos, um, have you ever felt that you, your opinion of the family, say, for example, changed so much that you would want to discard the beginning of your work because you thought you got them all wrong? Or would you keep that as documenting your journey of <coughs> discovery or something? How would you deal with that? What if sort of further down the line I feel that it was all wrong? Um, I think I kind of know enough that I, I won't feel that it's all wrong, um, I hope. Um, but I might definitely probably choose the, the images from my later um, works. I think that's always stronger because you've got a deeper connection, deeper understanding. Just like with the under gods, I was taking less, you said, I tend to take less photos um, because you know what you're wanting and they tend and they'll be stronger. Well, I hope. <laughs> See, it worked before. Um, yeah, so I don't think I'll feel that they're, I still feel they're very useful. Um, I don't think I'll completely scrap everything, but it might be that my images that I choose for the main edit will be from the later work. OK, well, I think we're going to leave it there. So um, thanks a lot to you, Liz, and Gideon and Chris as well. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>